Hello everyone. I hope you are all healthy and well. Welcome to the next talk in our Golden Webinars in Astrophysics series. Our speaker today is Joe Primak, who is Distinguished Professor of Physics Emeritus at the University of California, Santa Cruz. My name is Demetra De Cicco and together with Thomas Puzia, we have organized today's webinar for you. As in our previous webinars, simultaneous language interpretation is provided by Patricia Gonzalez, who will be simultaneously translating for us into Spanish. En sus dispositivos pueden escuchar la interpretación al español de la conferencia al pinchar el botón de interpretación que se encuentra en la parte inferior derecha de la ventana de la aplicación Zoom y seleccionar Español. We would like to acknowledge the general support of the Center for Astrophysics and Related Technologies, also known as CATA for its Spanish acronym. Thank you so much, everyone, for all your feedback and all your comments again. We really appreciate them. Um, please make suggestions for uh, future improvements in our uh, final survey that we will uh, post to you at the end of this of this webinar. If you're watching a recording of this YouTube of this talk on YouTube, you can leave comments below or you also email them to us. Um, if you would like to support the Golden Webinar series, we would also appreciate that if you send us an email. Um, if you have any questions during the talk, please type them in the Q&A window and uh, you can also upvote questions from other uh, viewers. Uh, we will select them, the best questions for the discussion after the talk. Uh, just as a note, the link to the live version of this recording uh, will be automatically taken down by YouTube shortly after the streaming ends. However, again, we will um, update our YouTube channel with the high resolution version, both in English and in Spanish. So before we begin, let's introduce the panelists that are with us today. Of course, Joel, our speaker, Patricia, our interpreter, Demetra, and myself. And from the Institute of Astrophysics, um, we have our postdoc, Doro Fallos, Paula Ronco, and Elizabeth Arto de la Villamoire, and our graduate student, Alvaro Banzuela. We also have the great pleasure to welcome our guest panelists today. We have Anna Vodragovic, Research Associate from the Astronomical Observatory of Belgrade, Serbia, Susan Kassin, Associate Astronomer at the Space Telescope Science Institute, Angela Henfel, Postdoctoral Researcher at Universidad Andres Bello in Santiago and at ISO La Silla Observatory, Maren Enfel, Postdoctoral Researcher at Universidad Andres Bello in Santiago and at ISO La Silla Observatory, Rohan Rahat Gonkar, Research Intern at, intern at Gemini Observatory. We have Ichan Guo, Assistant Professor of Physics and Astronomy at University of Missouri. Daniel Severino, Ramon y Cajal Professor at Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. John Holtzman, Professor and Head of the Department of Astronomy at New Mexico State University. Julio Navarro, Lansdowne Professor of Science at the University of Victoria, Canada. And Alberto Dominguez, Research Fellow at Universidad Complutense de Madrid. And last but not least, we have our excellent Q&A managers, Simon Angel and Ricardo Acevedo. So it is our great pleasure to introduce Joel Primak as our Golden Webinar speaker today. Joel obtained his Bachelor of Arts in Physics in 1966 at Princeton University and his PhD in Physics in 1970 at Stanford University. He then joined Harvard University as Junior Fellow of the Society of Fellows. After three years, he moved to University of California, Santa Cruz, where he was Assistant Professor of Physics until 1977, then Associate Professor of Physics for four years and then Professor of Physics since 1983. He was appointed Distinguished Professor in 2007 and has been Professor Emeritus since 2014. In 1977, Joel shared the American Physical Society Forum on Physics and Society Award in 1977 with Frank von Hippel of Princeton University for their book Advice and Dissent, Scientists in the Political Arena. In 1988, he became a fellow of the APS for pioneering contributions to gauge theory and cosmology. Then he was elected to the executive committee of the APS division of astrophysics in 2001. In the subsequent years, he held several positions in the APS, including chairman um, of the APS committee and NASA funding for astronomy. In 1995, Joel was also made a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, holding various positions in different committees. He received several honors, including the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation Senior Award in 1999, the APS Leo Schillard Lecture Award in 2016, and the APS Julius Edgar Lilienfeld Prize in 2020. 
Joel's research is centered on galaxy formation and evolution, cosmology, and on the nature of dark matter. He's one of the creators of the standard model of particle physics. In 1982, he was the first person to propose the lightest supersymmetric particle as the ideal candidate for dark matter. He co-authored more than 200 referees' technical articles in professional scientific journals, together with a number of books and articles aimed at more popular science audiences. His articles on efforts to protect the near-Earth space environment have appeared in Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist Science Scientific American and Technological Review. So now we would like to hand over to Joel, who will be telling us about the very new challenges in cosmology, galaxy formation, and planetary science. Joel, we are all yours. Well, I'm delighted to uh, be invited to give one of these golden webinars in astrophysics. <clears throat> As uh, Thomas said, I'm going to be talking about cosmology, galaxies, and planets. The basic theme is that we don't know the full story on cosmology, galaxies, and planets. We don't really understand yet how the universe works. And we have challenges in all of these areas. The challenge I'm going to be talking about in cosmology is what we call the Hubble tension. The fact that we get different numbers for the expansion rate of the universe. If we use early universe measurements like the cosmic background radiation versus nearby measurements going out to a gigaparsec or so. And uh, I'm going to focus especially on the so-called early dark energy scenario as a possible resolution of this. Uh, regarding galaxies, I'm going to mention several problems. In particular, the massive star forming clumps seen in many high redshift galaxies that the best simulations don't seem able to reproduce. And then finally on planets, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about uh, a discovery that my group made just recently that the amount of uranium and thorium which provide most of the heat of the earth, uh, the amount of uh, the, the abundance of these uh, long lived radioactive elements is quite uh, variable uh, in different stellar systems and, and their planets. And the consequence is that those planets may be much less habitable if they don't have the, the right amount of uranium and thorium. So starting now with cosmology, this background picture is of course the ultra deep field. And this is uh, the version taken by the Advanced Camera for Surveys and Hubble Space Telescope. It's beautiful but misleading since it only shows about half of 1% of cosmic density. The other 99.5% of the universe is invisible. We can represent cosmic density by this pyramid with the big base of the pyramid, dark energy, about 70% of cosmic density, cold dark matter about 25%, and atoms about 5%, but of that 5%, only a tenth, half a percent, is visible. Mostly hydrogen and helium, of course, but also a very tiny fraction, about a hundredth of 1% in all the more massive atoms. Now this image is based on the so-called Great Seal of the United States on the back of the American dollar bill, which we repurpose here to represent the hydrogen and helium that come out of the Big Bang, that's the composition of the first stars, and that hundredth of 1% of cosmic density that represents all other visible atoms. Those are formed in stellar processes, including merging neutron stars. And uh, so the whole table of the elements, except for the first uh, row, hydrogen and helium, uh, is the result of stellar processes. Many stars in the early universe may have been much more massive than our sun and binary star systems with other massive stars. When these stars ended their lives as supernovas, they became massive black holes. The Laser Interferometer Gravity Wave Observatory, LIGO, has now detected more than 50 mergers of massive black holes. This confirmed predictions of Einstein's general relativity that had never been tested before. So here's a sonification of that first detection uh, by LIGO 
Hanford and LIGO Livingston in Washington State and in Louisiana. So the chirp only lasts a, a couple of seconds, but uh, it contains a huge amount of information. In August of 2017, LIGO and the European gravity wave detector, Virgo, announced the discovery of gravity waves from merging neutron stars. And data from telescopes showed that this first event uh, probably generated uh, about 5% of the mass of the sun in heavy elements, the so-called R process elements, including something like 10 times the mass of Earth just in gold. So uh, this periodic table of the elements that I showed before uh, shows in orange, the elements that are produced by merging neutron stars and perhaps other uh, equally rare processes. So here's another version of that cosmic density pyramid with the bottom uh, part of the pyramid representing the 70% dark energy, the next 25% uh, representing cold dark matter and the top 5% representing atomic matter. Imagine that the entire universe is an ocean of dark energy. On that ocean sail billions of ghostly ships made of dark matter. But we don't see the ocean, we don't see the ships. All we see is the small fraction of the visible matter representing 5%, uh, sorry, 0.5% of cosmic density that uh, uh, glows and reflects light and uh, only a tiny fraction of that is the heavy elements that are so important for life. So dark matter ships and a dark energy ocean. Uh, in our popular books on this, my wife and I, uh, Nancy Abrams and I call this the double dark theory because it's mostly dark matter and dark energy. The, of course, standard name is Lambda CDM, Lambda Einstein's uh, symbol for uh, the cosmological constant, uh, the simplest form of dark energy and CDM for cold dark matter. So here's the secret of cold dark matter. Uh, on the upper left, uh, you see scales of 10 to the six solar masses, 10 to the nine solar masses, 12, 15, 18, 21. And you see that as they come inside the horizon, that is they just come above that dashed line, uh, they're all just about the same amplitude. Delta is, uh, delta rho over rho, the amplitude of the fluctuations. And what you see is that the scales of 10 to the 6, 9, and 12 solar masses don't grow very much. And that's because radiation is still dominant when they come inside the horizon, and only the dominant component grows rapidly. At a redshift of about uh, 10 to the 4.5, uh, matter finally dominates. And then all of these scales grow more or less at the same rate, namely proportional to the scale factor A, which is just one over one plus the redshift. The result is that the small 10 to the six, 10 to the nine, et cetera, scales don't grow that much differently. The smaller ones grow a little bit more, but not very much. And so you get this characteristic cold dark matter spectrum, uh, fairly flat, on the low mass scales and then more steeply declining on the high mass scales. Very different from white noise, very different from hot dark matter, which is cut off on the so-called free streaming scale, which corresponds to the scale of massive clusters. Let's zoom in on the uh, upper left corner to see what the real magic of this is. So it basically when uh, the amplitude becomes of order unity, that's when structure forms. And of course, some rare structures will start forming a little bit before that, because this is the median amplitude. Uh, so dwarf galaxies start forming at redshifts of 20, 25, or something like that. Milky Way mass galaxies start forming at redshifts of 10 or so. And clusters start forming at low redshifts. And that's quite consistent with observations. So that's the the thing that's telling us that there's something fundamentally right about this idea. So that spectrum that I showed you, flatter at low mass scales and steeper at high mass scales, has now been tested by observations on all these different scales. And the agreement is really quite spectacular. 
The most stringent tests are those associated with the cosmic background radiation. And these are the final data from the Planck satellite. In the upper graph, you see the temperature uh, angular uh, power spectrum. In the lower right, the uh, E-type polarization power spectrum. And in the lower left, the temperature polarization cross correlation. And what you see is that the blue curves, which represent the double dark theory, lambda CDM predictions, are essentially a perfect match. And th this remains true even at larger wave numbers, L, angular uh, power numbers, uh, angular multiples, uh, as seen from the ground, for example, in the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, ACT. So again, tremendous agreement with the double dark theory lambda CDM. However, the Hubble parameter as measured from the early universe is, and then extrapolated to the present with standard lambda CDM is 67.4 with an uncertainty of only about 0 0.4, 0 0.5. And if you measure nearby, you get much higher numbers something like 73 plus or minus one, in, all in the standard units of kilometers per second per megaparsec. One possible resolution is called early dark energy, a brief period of about 10% extra dark energy contributing to 10% of cosmic density at a redshift of around 3,500. So how does that work? So on the left, we're showing how uh, that moves the early universe value to be consistent with the nearby universe values. And on the right, we're showing the cosmic density in radiation, matter, and dark energy. The solid curves are the early dark energy version. The dash curves are standard lambda CDM. So uh, in standard lambda CDM, there's of course an enormous dark energy contribution in cosmic inflation at much higher redshifts than we're showing here. Uh, and then uh, basically no uh, contribution from dark energy until nearly at the present. And at low redshifts, you see that dark energy becomes dominant. In the early universe, radiation is dominant. Then there's a switch over to matter dominance because the radiation uh, scales uh, uh, more rapidly. The average temperature is declining at the same time as the density is decreasing. Whereas with matter, it's only the, the uh, density decline that's important. And it's right around the switch over time at around redshift of 3,500 that uh, the early dark energy peaks, but even at the peak, only contributing about 10% of cosmic density. That's what's needed to make the Hubble parameter problem go away. Now, uh, this does result in an earlier, uh, a lower age universe. And a recent preprint by Mike Boylan Colchin and Dan Weiss showed that the reionization era, which we know is at redshifts of six to 10, corresponds to different cosmic ages. In the standard Planck normalized lambda CDM, uh, it's around uh, 10 to the 12 point something to 10 to the 13 and a half or so uh, years ago. But in the early dark energy, it's somewhat more recent because the age of the universe itself is only about 13.2 uh, gig years, not 13.8. Uh, the oldest stars, for example, in the old globular cluster Messier 92 in the Milky Way, have ages that are estimated to be 12.75 gig years with an optimistic assumption that the uh, uncertainty is only half a gig year. That's represented by this blue uh, band here. That corresponds to a formation redshift of about five and a half in standard Planck normalized lambda CVM, but about 10 in uh, the early dark energy story. Is that a problem? It's not obvious that it is uh, an insurmountable problem. It could very well be that these things formed earlier than big galaxies like the Milky Way. The highest redshift galaxy we've seen so far has a redshift of about 11, and no doubt uh, James Webb is going to see even earlier ones. Now, uh, what I plotted at the top here are five recent papers about early dark energy. 
And at the bottom, the standard lambda CDM normalized by Planck. And uh, of course, as I've said before, that's giving a Hubble parameter of about 67.4, whereas these other versions are, are designed to give a higher Hubble parameter and better agreement with the local measurements of the expansion rate. Notice that all of them have, all of these versions are pretty similar. They have a somewhat lower value of omega matter than standard lambda CDM. They have a lower age because of the higher Hubble parameter. The primordial power spectrum is A sub S, K to the N sub S, where K is the wave number. And notice that the A sub S is a little bit larger for all of these early dark energy models fit to the same cosmic microwave background data. And the N sub S is substantially larger, not 0.96, but 0.98 or 0.99. Correspondingly, sigma eight, the uh, amplitude of the fluctuations on a scale of eight H inverse megaparsecs in linear theory is also larger. So there's more power, uh, especially on these smaller scales corresponding to large K than in standard lambda CVM. So uh, that led my colleagues and, and me to work out the implications of this with n-body simulations. And our paper led by Anatoly Klippen uh, has recently been accepted and uh, it's on the archive. Uh, it'll be published by monthly notices. And what you see here is that uh, although at redshift zero, the two models are almost uh, identical in their power spectrum. As you go out to higher redshift, early dark energy is increasingly higher power. Correspondingly, if you look at the uh, abundance of dark matter halos, what you see is that at redshift zero, they're practically the same, only a slight increase for the most massive halos. But at redshift one, there's about a 50% increase in cluster mass halos. That's about 10 to the 14.5 mass halos, uh, basically uh, uh, Virgo cluster type halos. Uh, and at redshift four, there's uh, a factor of two increase in the most massive galaxy halos. And correspondingly, as, as you go out to even higher redshift, uh, the reionization epoch, there will be a, a, an even larger increase. There's a small change, uh, small increase in the baryon acoustic oscillation length scale, still consistent with observations, but going to be severely tested by observations from uh, DESI, the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument, Euclid and other observations. Uh, and uh, the abundance of clusters, for example, is going to be tested by the EROSITA satellite data, which is measuring uh, 100,000 uh, clusters, X-rays from clusters, and of course, a million uh, active galactic nuclei. Uh, so this theory makes predictions that can be tested at reasonably low redshift that's accessible to observations. And it's gonna be very interesting to see which is right, standard lambda CDM or models that do early universe changes like early dark energy. All the, the early universe changes uh, are gonna result in somewhat similar predictions to this one early dark energy model. It's the Smith version that uh, we used here. Now to test these things, you do cosmological dark matter simulations. Astronomical observations of course represent snapshots of the moment in time when the light left the galaxies. It's the role of astrophysical theory to produce movies, metaphysical, metaphorical rather, and actual that link the snapshots together into a coherent physical theory. So let's see some of these simulations. The drunk is sitting on the step saying, quarks, neutrinos, mesons, all those damn particles you can't see, that's what drove me to drink. But now I can see them. So you too can see the dark matter. But this is to remind us that uh, in fact, what we're showing with light is actually dark matter density. It's all really invisible. So here's a region of the universe that's expanding with the Big Bang that's going to form the dark matter halo of a galaxy. It's expanding and expanding, but notice that the center is now actually falling together and not expanding, although regions around it are still flying away. So to recapitulate, expansion and then 
the end of expansion, about halfway from the Big Bang to now, on the left-hand side. And then today, the universe is effectively divided into regions where gravity has stopped the expansion and is holding everything together, and regions where the dark energy is gravitationally dominant and space is expanding faster and faster. Uh, in our popular uh, writing on this, Nancy Abrams and I call this tame space, tamed by gravity versus wild space. If you do high resolution simulations, you find that the dark matter halo of a galaxy like the Milky Way looks something like this. This is from uh, the Aquarius simulation by Volker Springle. Uh, the Milky Way visible uh, galaxy is about 100,000 light years across, but the Milky Way's dark matter halo is more than 10 times larger in all three dimensions. So its volume is more than a thousand times that of the visible Milky Way. How does this fit into the large scale structure? More or less like this. You see that the structure is extremely filamentary. The dark matter halos, the yellow dots, are mostly located along these dark matter filaments and where the filaments cross, you get the more massive dark matter halos that host groups and clusters of galaxies. Let's look at one of those groups or clusters. In fact, we'll look at one of the most massive ones in this particular simulation. So now what we're gonna do is visualize a region that's only a thousandth the size of the simulation. This beautiful visualization was made by Christopher Henze at uh, NASA Ames Research Center. We're rotating it so that you can see the three-dimensional structure. And what you see is that that massive halo at the center, the big white region, is at the intersection of filaments. Most of the dark matter halos are located along these filaments. And where the filaments cross, you get these more massive structures. How did the halo of that big cluster form? Well, we keep track of every single dark matter particle during these simulations. And what I'm gonna show you now is all of the dark matter structures that join together to form that massive halo. So these are all the dark matter halos, each of them hosting a galaxy or several galaxies that fall together to form that single dark matter halo that corresponds to a cluster of galaxies at the center of that rotating image I showed you. Notice that most of these dark matter halos, especially the more massive ones, are quite prolate. They have one long axis and two shorter axes. Of course, we don't just keep track of the dark matter halos that form this one massive object, we keep track of all of them. And uh, we are using Peter Beruzzi's uh, technology for doing this. Rockstar and consistent trees is what it's called. Let's look at uh, the whole evolution of a fairly large region of the universe. Uh, we could show it two different ways. One, expanding with the expansion of the universe like that one I showed before. The trouble with that is that you don't get much information at the early stages because it's so small. If you wanna see what's really going on, you blow up all of these to their current size. We call that working in co-moving coordinates. And that's what I'm going to show now. So this is a visualization of the nearby region of the universe, the so-called constrained local universe simulation. You see that very early in the first billion years, you're already getting this filamentary structure quite apparent. And the filaments start out quite thin, but they get thicker. And also matter moves along the filaments toward the regions where the filaments cross, where these massive halos are formed. Okay, well, this particular simulation is now ended uh, and we're simply moving through it. So let's skip on to the next part of the talk where I'm gonna talk about galaxies. So as you look out in space, you look back in time because of the finite speed of light. 
the galaxies nearby, the spiral and elliptical galaxies, don't look much different from those that we see as we look out uh, four and a half billion years ago to the sphere of time when the Earth formed and the solar system. However, as you look back to when big galaxies were forming, about redshift of two, about 10 billion years ago, uh, then you start to see rather different galaxies. So between that and the highest redshifts we can see with Hubble, we're seeing these very irregular, mostly elongated galaxies. And then uh, there's the cosmic dark ages. We're going to be able to see a little bit further into the dark ages uh, with James Webb Space Telescope, but uh, they're dark because for much of that time, stars hadn't formed yet. The outer colorful sphere is the cosmic background radiation color coded by temperature. And the outermost sphere is the Big Bang itself. Matter clumps together under the force of gravity as the universe expands, forming large structures, these dark matter halos. Uh, gas accretes from the cosmic web into galaxies where it cools and forms stars. Massive stars affect their surrounding interstellar medium through supernovae radiation and winds. And massive black holes grow at the centers of galaxies and those can affect their evolution via radiation winds and jets. There are two major discoveries about the connection between dark matter and the visible matter and about the growth rate of uh, the stellar mass of galaxies that are represented by these two uh, crucial figures. So one is this inverted U-shape curve and that shows the stellar mass over halo mass divided, uh, represented uh, as a function of halo mass. What you see is that at around 10 to the 12 solar masses, about 3%, 2 or 3% of the mass of 10 to the 12 solar mass halos is stars. Now, initially that may be a little surprising because the ratio of gas to stars cosmically is not 0 0.03, it's 0.17. So only about a fifth or so of the gas turns into stars, even at the most efficient star forming galaxies and the most efficient star forming halos at around a halo mass of 10 to the 12. If you go down a factor of 10 or up a factor of 10, uh, the fraction of gas turning into stars is even much less. The second regularity we call the main sequence. And here what we're doing is plotting the star formation rate on the vertical axis, the log of it, versus the log of the stellar mass of the galaxies on the horizontal axis. And what you see is if the star formation rate grows proportional to the mass, just linearly, you get a curve with this slope. And that's the slope except at the high mass end. And uh, as you go out in redshift, the normalization changes, the zero point changes, but the slope stays pretty much the same. Uh, the reason that they flatten out at the highest masses is at least partly because the centers of the galaxies have stopped forming stars at these high masses. So these are two important regularities. We call this one the main sequence in uh, analogy to the main sequence of stellar evolution, uh, stars that are burning hydrogen, uh, the most important parameter that describes their behavior is their stellar mass. Rotation, uh, metallicity are additional parameters, but the most important one uh, is the stellar mass. And the same is true of the star formation rate of galaxies. So almost all the galaxies today, or all the stars today rather, are in large galaxies like our Milky Way. Nearby large galaxies or disk galaxies like ours are big balls of stars called elliptical galaxies. But most galaxies in the early universe didn't look anything like our Milky Way. Many of them are pickle-shaped and clumpy. We're just now figuring out how galaxies form and evolve with the help of big ground-based telescopes and Hubble and other space telescopes that let us see radiation that doesn't penetrate the atmosphere or that's uh, disturbed as it penetrates the atmosphere. Uh, a tremendous improvement in our ability to see what galaxies really look like occurred in 2009 when 
On the last visit to Hubble Space Telescope, astronauts installed Wide Field Camera 3, which allowed us to see the full stellar population of galaxies that are still in the process of forming out to redshift two and a half. So these are pictures of exactly the same galaxies in the bottom as seen by the Advanced Camera for Surveys, which basically just sees visible light. And at the top by Wide Field Camera 3, and in particular, its longest wavelength uh, filter, uh, 1.6 microns. And what you see is that uh, when you're just looking at visible light from these galaxies at redshift of two, uh, what you're seeing is light that started out ultraviolet and was mainly emitted by the massive stars that live a few million years when a bunch of stars form. So you're really just seeing regions of star formation. But on the top, you're seeing the same galaxies, but now you're seeing the, the full stellar population of these galaxies. And so you get a much better picture of what's going on. Emergent spheroids, emergent disks, hidden mergers. The Candell survey was the survey that uh, had the largest amount of Hubble time and took uh, many of the images that uh, we've been analyzing. Uh, and it allowed us to see not only the nearby universe, which we're calling cosmic afternoon here, but cosmic high noon when star formation peaks, this is the star formation rate, which peaks at around redshift of two, two and a half. And uh, also we been, began to get a glimpse of cosmic dawn when galaxies first start forming. And of course, we're depending on James Webb and future space telescopes to let us see that in much more detail. So first question, do galaxies start as disks? Newton's laws explain why planetary orbits are elliptical, but not why the planetary orbits in the solar system are nearly circular in the same plane and with the planets going around in the same direction as the sun rotates. Newton called that evidence of God's handiwork. But Laplace explained this as a consequence of angular momentum conservation as the sun and planets formed in a cooling and contracting protoplanetary gas cloud that formed a disk like this one. And it turns out we've seen many of these disks uh, the gaps in the disks are presumably uh, where planets that are forming are removing some of that dust. For similar reasons, many astronomers once thought that galaxies would start as disks, but HST images of forming galaxies show that most galaxies are prolate, that is pickle-shaped. And this is a consequence of galaxies forming in prolate dark matter halos oriented along massive dark matter filaments. This is from uh, a review by Jacob Zeldovich he died in uh, early 1988, uh, but he had already understood why we would have this highly filamentary distribution of dark matter. Uh, first pancakes form by collapse along one dimension. And then uh, this uh, pancake, uh, pancake formation uh, overlaps, eventually forming a complex cellular structure where compressed, compressed gas layers, and of course he didn't realize it's gonna be mostly dark matter, are surrounded by low density regions. But, and this is a picture of the bottom of a swimming pool and these uh, optical caustics are actually described by essentially the same mathematics as the filamentary structure of the universe, which is what uh, Zeldovich is pointing out here. So uh, when we studied the shape evolution of dark matter halos, this is a paper led by my former graduate students, uh, Brandon Allgood and Ricardo Flores. Uh, what we saw was that uh, although halos start very prolate, this is the ratio of short axis to long axis, one would be spherical. And these are uh, of course quite prolate. And as halos become more massive as time goes on from redshift three to redshift zero, they evolve in shape in the direction of becoming more spherical. But uh, even, uh, so, uh, stellar, even Milky Way mass halos today are quite uh, prolate and clusters are extremely prolate and that's consistent with observations. So a high redshift halo accretes mainly along its filament and uh, the dark matter is moving randomly, mainly in higher velocities in this direction than in the two perpendicular directions along the filament. And similarly with the stars that come in, which are also non-collisional, uh, they're so small they never hit. Uh, and so they also have random velocities that are greatest in this direction and less in the perpendicular directions. As time goes on, the filaments become thicker and the accretion is more spherical. 
So this is from a recent paper led by uh, Hauen Zhang, who's now a graduate student at uh, Arizona, University of Arizona. Uh, and what we showed here is that galaxies start out more, mostly prolate and end up mostly disky. Uh, red is disky, uh, blue is prolate. And so you see that for the majority of galaxies, which are these low mass galaxies, stellar mass 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 9.5 solar masses, a majority of them are prolate down to redshift of one. Uh, even the more massive ones, a majority are prolate at high redshift. Now, how do we tell that they're prolate? Because all we ever see are uh, 2D images. And the answer is statistics. If galaxies are spheroidal, they're always going to have a large ratio of short axis to long axis. Disk galaxies must have to have must have an even distribution of axis ratios. If you see them face on, they'll be more or less uh, circular. If you see them edge on, they'll be flattened, and you'll have to see them in every different orientation because the orientations are random. But if galaxies are prolate, they're always going to have small axis ratios except edge on, except end on, and and then of course they'll have an axis ratio near one. And that's exactly what we see. We see at high redshift mostly prolate and at lower redshift, mostly disks. Every dot in this picture is a galaxy in the Candell survey. The color code is uh, extinction. So let's look here at nearby uh, galaxies that are fairly massive. Uh, the uh, upper mass is similar to the mass of the Milky Way. And what you see is that there's a pretty even distribution at large uh, scale. These are the big galaxy images, large uh, longest axis, and that the uh, vertical is the axis ratio. And so you see a nice distribution of axis ratios. And not only that, you see that the ones that have a small axis ratio that we're seeing edge on uh, have a lot of extinction. And that's just what you'd expect if you're seeing edge on disk and you're looking through a lot of that dust. But if you look in the early universe, you get these uh, banana shaped segments. And what those are showing you is very few high axis ratios, mostly low axis ratios, and also very little evidence of extinction. So what we're looking at is not edge on galaxies, we're looking at prolate galaxies. So to understand how galaxies form, we run hydrodynamic galaxy simulations, simulating some region of the universe and if you want to have very high resolution, unfortunately, limited computer time means that you have to simulate a fairly small region. So we do that and we get results like this. This is the dark matter distribution. That's the star distribution. And uh, I'm running a little low on time, so I'm not going to be able to show this whole video. But what happens is that uh, the dark matter and the stars stay well aligned. And after a while, uh, another galaxy comes in to this volume and it, uh, it merges along the same long axis. And then several more uh, such things happen. And that's how we get these prolate galaxies forming along uh, dark matter filaments. So this was our first paper on this published in uh, 2015. What we found was that when the centers of the, uh, the galaxies are still mostly formed of dark matter, that's when they're elongated, representing this elongated dark matter distribution. But as soon as the centers become mostly stellar mass rather than dark matter mass, then they become much rounder. Uh, in a subsequent paper led by uh, postdoc Thomas Eddy, uh, we found that they're aligned with the cosmic web filaments and they become round after compaction events, which mean gas flowing into the central uh, galaxy causing a starburst. We look to see if the alignments of the prolate galaxies trace the cosmic web and a paper led by uh, Viraj Pandya. And uh, we didn't see that, but we think that that's mainly because we don't have enough redshifts of these low mass likely prolate galaxies. A thousand more redshifts would probably be enough to uh, answer the question. Uh, very quickly, let me just uh, summarize results of many papers from the Candell survey, uh, in particular a series starting in 2013 led by Guillermo Barrow. 
where we showed that galaxies typically start rather diffuse in size and become more and more compact. What we're plotting here is the star formation rate divided by mass, specific star formation rate, increasing downward. So these are galaxies that have high star formation rates and are fairly diffuse. And then it looks like they're evolving into galaxies that are more compact. That doesn't mean the stars move. It means that there's a big burst of star formation in the center because of a big flow of gas into the center, what we call compaction events. And that makes these so-called star forming or blue nuggets. And they evolve quickly into not star forming, quenched nuggets, red nuggets. Uh, this is that same kind of diagram. Uh, star formation rate effectively increasing downward, compactness increasing to the right. And what you see here is that in this compact star forming uh, quadrant, you're seeing a high fraction, up to 60% of these galaxies of X-ray detected active galactic nuclei. So we called this the fast track of galaxy evolution, here to here to here. But lots of galaxies don't ever make it into this high density, uh, high star formation region. And they more slowly evolve, never becoming highly compact into spiral galaxies like the Milky Way. And in our simulations, we saw both kinds, the fast track and the slow track. So the way these work is gas flows into the center, fueling star formation, and then the stellar mass exceeds the, star, the, the dark matter mass in the inner kiloparsec. But then after that, very few stars form in the central region. In the galaxy as a whole, stars continue to form and the dark matter nevertheless remains dominant. So we can follow uh, an example of this. This is showing uh, 20 kiloparsec across region. This is gas. This is stars, and uh, this is face on, this is edge on. And here we're tracking inner five kiloparsecs, inner one kiloparsec. Red is stars, black is dark matter, blue is gas. So now a compaction event is just about to happen. A bunch of gas is flowing into the center, you can see it there, and it's fueling a big burst of star formation in the center. And after a little while, we get a nice disk galaxy, nice edge on disk, nice spiral arm pattern. So basically what's happening is that we're getting several examples of compaction events, gas flowing into the center, usually by some kind of external cause like mergers or counter rotating gas flows. And then the gas gets turned into stars and what's left is driven out by supernova uh, winds. But then there can be another external event that causes more gas to flow into the center and there can be a second compaction event. And then finally, the galaxy will stop forming stars in the center and maybe even stop forming stars on larger scales. So does this happen in the real universe? To test this, we trained a deep learning code, a convolutional neural net, uh, this is mainly Mark Werda's company's uh, idea to do this. Uh, so we classified our simulations, uh, different stages of the simulations into pre-compaction, compaction, and post-compaction. And uh, we labeled the, the images that way. We made realistic looking images, taking into account stellar evolution and dust. And uh, we trained uh, the deep learning code to look at the images and tell what stage they were in. And the, and the deep learning code could do that. And then we applied the same code to the real universe. So this is what uh, the training set looked like. Uh, these are high resolution images, pre-blue nugget or, or pre-compaction, blue nugget or compaction, post-blue nugget. This is at Hubble resolution. And these are real Hubble images that look basically just like these. And this was the result. Uh, what we found was that in the real universe, applying the same uh, trained deep learning code, uh, galaxies typically start at lower stellar masses, pre-compaction. Then you get a peak of compaction at around 10 to the 9.5 to 10 to the 10 solar masses. And then post-compaction after that. At higher redshifts, 
perhaps at a slightly higher mass scale, you, you get this uh, compaction and then post-compaction. Here, what we're showing is that when we have access to James Webb images that are much sharper, we're gonna do a lot better. So this is a complicated case where one has two big inflows of gas into the center, two bursts of star formation in the center. We've actually seen as many as three in our simulations. And uh, with James Webb quality images, uh, we can quite nicely see uh, pre-compaction here, first compaction, post-compaction, second compaction, second post-compaction. Now, we've run the same suite of galaxy simulations several times. And uh, Daniel Severino, who's uh, I think on our panel today, uh, is the one who actually did this. And uh, what Daniel found was that when we up the feedback and what we're calling generation six, uh, the galaxies are much more consistent with that inverted U-shaped curve of stellar mass over halo mass versus halo mass that I showed you earlier. Uh, but do they still form all these clumps? So these are images of clumpy galaxies at redshifts one, two, and three from Yi Ching Guo's 2015 paper, where he showed that the lower mass galaxies, those are these blue ones, uh, more than half of them are clumpy. These are star forming galaxies. Uh, then intermediate mass and high mass, they're all majority clumpy at ridges above two, and the higher mass, the clumpy fraction declines as you go down to lower redshift. And this is consistent with other observations. So these clumpy galaxies are, are really quite common. So the question is, uh, do the simulations make them? So these are uh, images uh, from our simulations uh, of Hubble and James Webb resolution and you see that James Webb is going to be able to see these images of galaxies much more clearly, and we'll be able to see the clumps much more clearly because it's a much bigger telescope, even at the same redshifts. Uh, and here's the difference between generation three weak feedback and generation six strong feedback. And you see that with strong feedback, these low mass clumps don't uh, show here. We're, we're getting high mass clumps, but also not as many high mass clumps. So here's a summary. This isn't published yet. Uh, and this is work uh, uh, by Mark Werda's company and especially Omri Ginsberg, a graduate student working with Abishai Dekel in Israel. Uh, so red is generation three, the lower feedback. And you see lots of more massive uh, clumps and lots of long lived clumps. And uh, in the paper that Ginsberg led, we showed that many of the clumps appear to be long lived. Uh, their stellar populations indicate that. And with the higher feedback, we're not getting these long lived clumps and we're not getting very many massive clumps. And uh, the fire simulations uh, seem to have the same problem. So uh, feedback uh, is one of the most uncertain parts of galaxy formation. And uh, we obviously are gonna have to understand it better. In the few minutes I have left, I want to say just a few things about uh, our work on planets. Most of what we know about uh, planets in the Milky Way comes from the Kepler program, which stared at the same 150,000 stars for a period of several years and uh, di discovered nearly 4,000 planetary systems. Uh, we've also, of course, discovered a fair number using stellar radial velocities from ground-based telescopes. We used to think that planetary systems look like our own with all the planets on circular orbits, rocky planets uh, in the center, uh, and uh, gas giants further out. But of the planetary systems we've discovered, there are very few like ours with all the planets widely spaced in nearly circular orbits. Most planetary systems are much smaller and those where we've discovered planets that are further away, the planets are mostly in quite elliptical orbits. The most common type of planet seems to be two to six times Earth's mass, a so-called super Earth. No such planet exists in our solar system. 
Some planets are in the habitable zone around their stars in which water would be in liquid form, but most of these planets are probably not hospitable to advanced forms of life. For one thing, they might not have an optimal abundance of the longest lived radioactive elements, thorium and uranium, the power of magnetic dynamo and plate tectonics. Too much thorium and uranium would result in a lava world with frequent flood volcanism. That's what caused the greatest mass extinction events on Earth. So our living Earth may be a rare Goldilocks planet with just the right amount of thorium and uranium. There also may be galactic habitable zones, not too close to galaxy centers where there are frequent supernovae and active galactic nuclear outbursts, nor too far when metals may be too rare to form rocky planets. However, recent measurements at redshifts greater than 0.6 find flatter increasing gas metallicity with radius. A uh, recent paper led by Raymond Simon shows that and, and also quotes uh, 100 uh, measurements from the literature that agree with that. So here are uh, artist conceptions based on our new uh, paper uh, of Earth, which has both a geodynamo and uh, so a magnetic field and also plate tectonics. If you increase, if you take an Earth type planet, but you increase the amount of thorium uranium by a factor of three, which is not uncommon, uh, you get a huge amount of volcanism. See all these volcanoes, much hotter mantle. But because the mantle is so hot, you get very little heat outflow from the outer core to the mantle. And so that turns off the geodynamo. If you have much less thorium and uranium, you have a very cold mantle, uh, a so-called stagnant lid planet uh, with no plate tectonics, although you could have a dynamo. So this summarizes our calculations. The paper was led by Francis Nemo. Uh, an expert on this at uh, uh, planetary science at uh, UC Santa Cruz. And what you see is that if you just have twice as much uh, uranium and thorium as Earth, and uh, that's about one sigma, uh, then there's a period of about half a gig year when you don't have uh, a geodynamo. If you have three times as much, then that's uh, a period of almost a gig year, maybe more when you have no dynamo. Well, there's evidence that Earth never lacked a, a dynamo for such a long period of time, if at all. Uh, you also have a tremendous amount of volcanism. If uh, you only have a third as much or half as much, uh, then you're very likely not gonna have uh, uh, plate tectonics. You'll have uh, a much cooler mantle. How can you tell how much uranium and thorium a planet has? Well, you can't, but you can tell how much its star has by measuring europium, for example. It's much more easily detected in stellar spectra. It's been measured in thousands of stars. And uh, it was recently shown that europium is an excellent tracer for thorium and uranium. They're both mainly, thorium and uranium are essentially exclusively R process elements and europium is mostly R process, therefore made in merging neutron stars. So if you wanna know what telescope, what, what uh, planets to point telescopes at to get evidence uh, for life, uh, may be important to look at the amount of europium in the stellar spectrum. In, in the solar system, there was a late great bombardment of the inner planets about 750 million years after the solar system formed. And it seems likely that there was a gigantic rearrangement of the outer solar system that caused many comets to hit the inner planets during this period, about three and a half billion years ago, 3.8 billion years ago. Primitive microbial life got started on Earth just about three and a half billion years ago, just after the late Great Bombardment. So primitive life formed very quickly on Earth and may be very common in the universe, at least on planets with liquid water. There may also be moons in the outer solar system. There are moons in the outer solar system with liquid water under their icy surfaces, including Jupiter's moon Europa and Saturn's moon Enceladus. And uh, these are geysers on Enceladus seen by Cassini and uh, Cassini actually ran through them and collected some of this water, but it didn't have the capability of measuring uh, organic molecules. Who expected this to find those? Uh, future uh, spacecraft will be able to do that. It took another 2 billion years for complex eukaryotic cells to develop on Earth, and complex multicellular creatures only evolved about half a billion years ago on Earth. So intelligent life and science only arose once on Earth and may be very rare. New space observatories may make it possible for us to detect the effects of life on distant planets. We'll also keep searching for messages 
and the huge square kilometer array of radio telescopes being built in Australia and South Africa will help. So this is what I wanted to say. These are the uh, points I made at the beginning. Let me conclude by saying that without dark matter, we wouldn't exist. With only the ordinary matter, the universe would be a low density featureless soup. Dark matter started to form structures very early. Galaxies form within the bound halos of dark matter. Stars formed within galaxies. Stars made elements beyond hydrogen and helium, carbon, oxygen, and so on. Rocky planets formed from these heavier elements. Life began and evolved on one such planet. So dark matter is our ancestor and our friend. But science is much stranger than fiction. Before the discovery that most of the density of the universe is invisible, no one imagined this. What else remains to be discovered? Thanks very much. Bravo. Wonderful talk. Thank you very much, Joel. So we're gonna take our usual 120 second break to sort our thoughts and questions. And we're gonna come back after the music is over. Okay, so thanks again, Joel, for the very beautiful and inspiring talk. We will start now with the questions. And specifically, we will start with Julio. Thanks, Mitra. Thanks, Joel, for uh, the talk. I guess it's wonderful to see us looking so well. My question was going to be, how is it possible that I met you 35 years ago, I think, and you still look exactly the same? But <laughs> I'll, spare you, I'll spare you that question, which is a hard one. And I uh, go to another one, which I'm actually echoing from the Q&A here for a few people, actually, from the Q&A. And uh, it is, you know, this early dark energy idea seems uh, reasonable. And of course, you know, can be made to fit the data that's available and make some predictions, but it does have some horribly fine-tuned and ad hoc. So is there any motivation in the particle physics community or in some you know, phase transition or something that may lead rise to this little bump in dark energy compared to what it ought to have been during the history of the universe? <laughs> So uh, to answer your first question, I've just been incredibly fortunate, I think, uh, that my health has uh, been good uh, and uh, that uh, I, I'm doing pretty well. I, I'm still having a great amount of fun doing uh, research, uh, even though I'm now 75 years old. Uh, and I hope the same is true for you, Julio, and uh, for uh, other people, including several of my former graduate students. Uh, thanks for uh, joining. Uh, now. Uh, it's absolutely correct that uh, the early dark energy story uh, is contrived. Uh, on the other hand, uh, another one of my former students, Kim Grice, pointed out back in 2002 that there's no reason that there couldn't have been one or more episodes of dark energy uh, between inflation and today. All it takes from the point of view of particle physics is to have a uh, scalar field that's not at the minimum of its potential. Uh, in that case, uh, T mu nu contributes, uh, has a contribution, G mu nu times the Lagrangian. Lagrangian has uh, the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. And so if the potential energy is non-zero, that's a dark energy. It's not going to have any effect if you set it to have the right amplitude uh, at this period, uh, about 35, uh, rich at about 3,500. It's not gonna have any effect in the earlier universe because the radiation density is much higher. But when it does have an effect, then there's a strong force acting on it that will cause the scalar field to slide down. Now it is true that you have a couple of parameters, the height and uh, basically uh, when this becomes important, uh, but every aspect of uh, both the standard model of particle physics and also the standard Lambda CDM model of cosmology uh, is exactly like that. It's all tuned. Uh, we don't predict the, the values of these parameters in advance. And in fact, as I said, it's, it was a shock that uh, the amount of ordinary matter is so small. Uh, that was not what uh, even smart people like Zeldovich expected until we were forced into it by the cosmic wave background observations. So, uh, there are, in some sense, two classes of problems concerning uh, particle physics and cosmology. One is to measure the parameters of the standard models, and the other is to 
uh, and to improve the, the standard models. And the other is to understand why they have the structure that they do. And uh, the second problem is uh, much deeper and harder. So I always tell my students, don't despair that we, we've solved all the problems. Far from it. Thanks for the question. Okay, thank you, John. Okay, John is next. Hi, Joel. <laughs> Thanks very much for an interesting talk and all of your contributions over the year. <laughs> well, Co-advising my dissertation. <laughs> um, I actually want to follow up on, on, that, on that question kind of in two extremes. So one maybe for the for the uh, people with less background in the audience. You know, seeing your ghost ships on dark waters and a tiny little light, you know, it sort of seems like lots of stuff is built on things that we can't see, which is astronomers who we say dark, you know? And, and the question is, you know, at the general public level, is this all being built on some unobservable house of cards? Maybe you could talk a little bit about detection efforts and, and, and stuff you know about that. After you address that on the flip side, you might say, okay, you're gonna convince everyone that this is really what's going on and it's understood. Then you talk about these things, the Hubble uh, constant tension uh, primarily, and, and, and there the question is, are we now, just what you just said, are we now just kind of nitpicking fine little details on a fairly well-established theory? And, and how do you motivate the students to say, are we, are we really about to under, uh, uncover something fundamental? Well, uh... Thanks for the, the questions. The first question is, uh, is this whole theory built on sand and likely uh, to collapse like uh, a house of cards? Uh, and I think the answer is no. And uh, the agreement between the observed cosmic microwave background, both the temperature and polarization and other features and the predictions of the theory that basically this very wiggly uh, uh, spectrum uh, the, the wiggles are absolutely characteristic of uh, uh, Lambda CDM. Uh, and uh, the adjustment of parameters was actually very small. We already knew roughly what the parameters were, except for a couple of nuisance parameters. And uh, with a small adjustment, you get this perfect agreement. Uh, and of course, you can uh, get equally good agreement uh, with this early dark energy version. Uh, and similarly with large scale structure. So the fact that uh, the theory agrees so well uh, with relatively few adjustable parameters, and we've got millions of data points and only a small number of adjustable parameters in standard Lambda CDM only six. Uh, that's I think very strong evidence that there's something fundamentally right. Now, the other question, which is, uh, can we really take seriously all this invisible stuff if we haven't been able to detect any of it? That's of course uh, a nightmare. Uh, the nightmare is that the dark matter is something that really doesn't interact with ordinary matter at all, except gravitationally. Uh, and that's entirely possible. There are zillions of uh, theoretical models of dark matter that fit that. Uh, what we're hoping is that it's not of that type. So uh, the version that I was uh, uh, among the first to uh, suggest, uh, namely, uh, supersymmetric dark matter, uh, the popular version being neutralinos, fortunately are very detectable. Uh, we, we should be able to make them with high enough energy at accelerators, although we haven't yet. We should be able to detect them uh, through direct detection, uh, deep underground uh, detectors, and they're getting much more sensitive. Uh, the LZ detector and uh, the 10 ton uh, uh, xenon detector, uh, there are two uh, outside the United States uh, at Gran Sasso and also in China, uh, they're gonna increase the sensitivity by several orders of magnitude. Uh, so they will either detect or essentially rule out uh, that class of models, the WIMP models. Uh, and then there's uh, indirect detection through annihilation. And there's actually evidence. Uh, we're seeing an annihilation, what could be an annihilation signal from the center of the Milky Way that Dan Hooper emphasizes is quite consistent with what we expected from uh, WIMP annihilation. The problem is that there are potentially other explanations, although the main other explanation, uh, which was uh, rapidly rotating neutron stars, uh, millisecond pulsars in other words, 
uh, doesn't look so good anymore. And uh, its main proponents are uh, now uh, saying uh, it may not be such a good idea. So uh, we have a hope that we are going to detect at least the dark matter. And of course, with dark energy, uh, the most exciting possibility is that it's dynamical, not just a property of space time, which is what the cosmological constant is. And if that's the case, we're going to see evidence of evolution when we can do the measurements at higher redshift more precisely. We look back in the universe, it's harder to see the effect of dark energy because ordinary matter is making such a larger contribution then. But the very careful measurements that we're going to be getting from the dark energy spectroscopic instrument, from uh, Euclid, uh, from the new generation of ground-based telescopes starting with Vera Rubin, uh, and the new space telescopes, uh, James Webb, but especially for this purpose, uh, uh, Nancy Grace Roman, uh, those are all uh, going to have the opportunity to uh, allow us to see new things that we hadn't expected. And uh, it hardly ever happens that we open a window uh, and we find uh, only what we expected. We almost always find something new, just as we did with the neutron star merger that turned out to uh, produce huge amounts of our process elements. And uh, because these are so rare, these neutron star mergers, uh, a few per million years, unlike uh, core collapse supernovae, which I've ordered one or two per century, they're going to have incomplete mixing and you're going to get very uh, wide uh, uh, dispersal, very wide di uh, distribution in the amount of uh, these heavy R process elements. And uh, as I said, uh, that leads to the expectation that uh, only a small fraction of rocky planets will turn out to be habitable. So uh, I think uh, the, I, you know, at the turn of the 20th century uh, in 1900, there were physicists like Larmer who said that uh, physics was basically dead. It was just a matter of finding uh, a few more decimal places in measurements. And of course, uh, relativity and quantum mechanics were completely unforeseen by people like that. And uh, I think it's quite likely that uh, uh, there are deep questions that uh, we're going to be able to answer in the future that we can hardly even imagine today. Okay, so Susan. Please go ahead. It's a perfect lead into my question. Uh, so Joel, you gave a fantastic overview of you know, progress made in the last few decades. Can I ask you to go on a limb, take some poetic license, and to start telling us about what you think over the next 10 years will be the, we're gonna find that's gonna be exciting or new. Um, and you don't have to be right. Um, and then maybe comment on the importance of such findings for, for mankind. Well, uh, Susan, you're one of the great experts on what we're going to be able to see with James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, so you know that uh, we haven't really seen galaxy formation starting, and we will as soon as we start to get the first images from James Webb. Uh, as I said, we only see the full, cell full stellar population with wide field camera three out to about redshift two and a half. Uh, and that's because its longest wavelengths are uh, about uh, H-band, 1.6 microns. But with NERCAM on James Webb, we get five microns. So uh, that means we're going to see full stellar populations out to redshift 10 or beyond. And uh, we're going to see amazing things. Uh, we may discover uh, stars, stellar processes, uh, more dramatic kinds of supernovae, uh, than we've ever seen before. And they may be so bright that we'll be able to see them out to these high ridges. Uh, we may discover new features of galaxy formation that uh, we hadn't seen before. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised that uh, we see novel features of active galactic nuclei, uh, especially once we have the E. Rosita uh, evidence on millions of AGM uh, and be able to tie that to the galaxies. Uh, so uh, we're, of course, going to be living in a tsunami of data. Uh, once uh, uh, the largest camera ever built, the 3.2 gigapixel camera on uh, Vera Rubin telescope starts operating and the LSST survey starts, uh, we're going to be generating 20 terabytes of data per night. Uh, all the telescopes in the world only see a few supernovae per year. We're going to detect 10,000 supernovae per night. And uh, 
if you make the usual plot of intensity of brightness basically uh, versus longevity of supernovae, uh, there used to be basically two regions, the sort of standard core collapse type two supernovae and uh, type 1a supernovae, and then a few rare ones, 1b and 1c. Uh, now we're filling in very different kinds of uh, objects as we're getting more transient events. And uh, so it turns out that there's failed supernovae, almost failed supernovae, hypernovae, et cetera. Uh, and uh, we don't really fully understand what the implications of that are for evolution. Uh, and I just briefly mentioned another thing that I thought was really a, a striking puzzle uh, from the most recent paper by your former student, uh, uh, Raymond Simons. Uh, and uh, I noticed that you aren't a co-author of that paper. It's always a very good thing for your graduate students to go out and uh, work with other people and do different things. Uh, and uh, I was shocked by the result, which uh, as they show is consistent with other observations. So I mentioned it, uh, that the metallicity gradient with radius is flat or rising. Now that's not crazy. Uh, if you have these uh, so-called compaction events, that's pristine gas flowing into the center of the galaxy. So the center of the galaxy in a compaction event is actually lower metallicity until the stars form and then raise up the metallicity. Uh, but to have the outer part of the galaxy have higher metallicity than the inner part fairly commonly, because that's what uh, uh, those 250 uh, galaxy observations show, that was striking. And then the big question is, how is that consistent with the stellar metallicity almost always declining? in the nearby observations where we can do those measurements. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, what I'm struck by is how many basic questions we have that are not answered. And these are questions that we're gonna be getting data for uh, directly. And then there's the more fundamental questions uh, that uh, uh, Julio Navarro and uh, John Holtzman asked about. Uh, the structure of our theories is something we don't understand. It's, it doesn't come from a deep understanding. Uh, so uh, we'd like to understand much better uh, why the universe is mostly dark matter and dark energy. Where did that come from? And what is that stuff? And, uh, and those are fundamental questions that we may or may not be able to get some insight on in the next 10 years. I'm hoping we'll get some insight on those in the next 10 years because I'm 75. And uh, you know, I'd like to know the answers to some of these questions uh, while, I still, while I still care. So, and of course, uh, all the rest of you no doubt feel the same way. Uh, so, but the great thing is uh, governments seem willing to spend billions of dollars on these wonderful telescopes. Isn't that fantastic? So Joe, we have very interesting questions from the audience. And well, related to what you just said, we have a question from Pavel Krupa who said, very nice and informative talk, but are, are you really certain that that dark matter exists. So do you want to comment on that? <laughs> well, nothing is certain. Uh, I tried to uh, indicate at the end of the talk, look, what I talked about were problems on the scale of cosmology, galaxies, in particular the feedback issue, and uh, planets. Uh, and in all areas, there are these fundamental questions that uh, we still need to answer, that uh, uh, obviously, we don't uh, fully understand. So I would be the last one to say, yes, I'm absolutely sure dark matter is uh, the story. Uh, on the other hand, the evidence is pretty persuasive and uh, attempts to explain little features of the universe uh, by modifications of gravity like MOND uh, are extremely limited in their success. Let, let's let's uh, put it that way uh, and confront very serious problems. Uh, whereas the basic cold dark matter story, Lambda CDM, is pretty good. But it does have these problems, uh, in particular the Hubble parameter tension and other tensions, the S8 tension, uh, uh, weak lensing always being low. Uh, uh, they certainly indicate that, that there are things we don't understand. So my attitude is uh, data is golden, theory is cheap. 
And uh, we've got to keep getting more data. And then it's up to uh, the theorists to try to understand what it's telling us. Okay, Thomas, next. Okay, so I'm going to take inspiration from the comment here by Dietrich Bade from the Q&A, who is uh, saying the following about the aspects of your planetary science research. So he says, a key difference between Earth and Venus is that Earth has a moon while Venus does not. And, and so the presence of the moon um, doesn't matter, but the way its formation happens probably does, right? So the mechanism that is inducing plate tectonics in the end. And so the way that this collision happened, likely, right, removed a third of the Earth's outer crust. And so isn't that sort of the explanation for plate tectonics and the uranium to thorium ratio is sort of the driver in the end? And of course, the you know the, the the deeper question here probably is that there are many many parameters that drive habitability on a planet of the mass of of our earth uh, not only of course uh, element ratios so uh i think the basic question has to do with why is venus so different from earth even though they're basically the same mass and venus uh was at least in the early uh, uh solar system in the habitable zone uh with liquid water on its surface uh, when the sun was 30% uh, less luminous than it is today. Uh, now, uh, the moon probably has something to do with it. Uh, so after the moon formed as a result of some uh, fairly major collision of the Earth, the forming Earth with a forming uh, protoplanet, uh, the Earth was spinning quite rapidly. And uh, as friction on the Earth, for example, today, the main source of friction is in the North Sea, the sloshing of the North Sea. Uh, that slows the Earth's rotation down. Conservation of angular momentum then forces the moon to move further and further away. So that's been going on for some time, and the Earth has slowed down. But the Earth is still rotating fairly rapidly. And incidentally, the moon has still played a very important role, not just in its formation. Uh, that's where most of the angular momentum of the solar system is. And so that has preserved the obliquity of the Earth's uh, uh, axis. And that's probably very important for uh, making it such a habitable planet. Now, Venus. Uh, rotates much more slowly, and its axis happens to be almost, uh, rotation axis is almost in the plane of the orbit, almost in the ecliptic. Uh, because of its very slow rotation, it would have a hard time generating a magnetic field even uh, with a liquid outer core. Uh, so it has essentially no magnetic field. Uh, and if it had had an early uh, collision, it probably would be spinning much faster the reason that it's a stagnant lid planet, i.e. with no plate tectonics, uh, probably has to do with the fact that it lost its water. And we don't know in detail how that happened, uh, but the fact that it's closer to the sun uh, made it easier for the water to evaporate and then the hydrogen to be lost. Uh, so uh, it's likely that that's part of the story of why Venus is so different from the Earth. Uh, in fact, of course, we don't know nearly as much about Venus as we do about Mars. Uh, in the case of Mars, it has a magnetic field, but it probably had a much stronger magnetic field early on. Uh, and it had lots of water, but because uh, of its low magnetic field, uh, it has no protection from the solar wind, and that blew away most of its atmosphere. Uh, so that's part of the reason that Mars is uh, somewhat less habitable. Uh, for every planet, there's going to be a complicated story. And uh, incidentally, what's important is the, uh, for the argument that we made is the ratio of uranium and thorium. Uranium and thorium are basically formed together and in a ratio that we more or less understand. Uh, it's the ratio uh, of the abundance of those elements, the radiogenic elements, those are the two longest lived radioisotopes, to the mantle composition, which is mostly alpha elements. Uh, silicon, magnesium, oxygen. Uh, and that's what we focused on in our paper. And, uh, and the abundance, uh, the, the one sigma is about a factor of two up or down with the uh, uranium and thorium compared to the alpha elements. Uh, and a factor of three is not uncommon. So, uh, and what we showed was that if you uh, have changes by as much as a factor of two or more, uh, that drastically changes the habitability because uh, at least half of the Earth's present heat is coming from uh, these two long-lived radioisotopes. In the early Earth, 
there was another radioisotope that was important, and that was uh, potassium-40. Uh, that contributed, that, but its half-life is only about a gig year. So after uh, four and a half gig years, it's uh, now quite negligible. But in the early, uh, and uh, uh, it's a volatile element. So uh, the amount of that in planets uh, will have a lot to do with things like uh, collisions that heat up the planets. So uh, the, the, this whole story, uh, one of the uh, things that uh, kept me young scientifically is I always like to find out about uh, what the most exciting new data is. And uh, planetary physics is fantastic because the amount of data that's coming in is fantastically large. Uh, and uh, so we now have the opportunity to, to try to answer fundamental questions that we didn't even know were important before. That's true. Um, that, that brings me to, to a corollary of this. Since you are running these, these high resolution simulations, wouldn't it be now pertinent to ask the question, so how much of a galactic habitable zone given those element ratios and these narrow margins that you found out is actually out there. Uh, so uh, Francis Nimmo is leading a proposal that we're going to be submitting uh, to NASA's uh, exoplanet study on exactly that question. Uh, so one of the things we want to do is uh, run our uh, galaxy simulations. But now uh, what we've done in the past uh, is taken into account core collapse and 1A supernovae. <clears throat> uh, but now what we uh, need to do is, number one, check and see if the results are consistent with these flat or rising with radius metallicity curves that uh, Simons and others uh, are finding observationally. And uh, assuming that that's what we're finding, so that it's consistent with observations, then the next question is, now let's put in uh, the uh, uh, R process generation by uh, rare events like merging neutron stars and uh, see what the metallicity distribution is and take that into account uh, when we uh, try to look at the galactic habitable zone. So uh, Line Weaver uh, wrote uh, what I think is the best review on galactic habitable zones, but these are, this is new information. And that may change that whole story, which is what I was hinting at in that uh, one little paragraph that I said. Thank you. Thank you. Alvaro, next. Hello, journalists. Thank you very much for your sublime talk. Um, I got inspiration for uh, from two questions actually from the Q and A. Uh, one is from Leonardo Castaneda, and the other one is from Ken MacLeod. But it's actually the same question. Leonardo says uh, nowadays uh, early dark energy models seems to be a real alternative uh, for problems beyond lambda CM model. However. Most of them are phenomenologic, phenomenological. <laughs> How to improve from first principle this altern alternative? Or, uh, as Ken asked later, is there a preferred physical explanation for early dark energy? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I listed five fairly recent papers uh, on early dark energy. And each one, well, uh, the first two are actually the same story. Uh, the Mergia paper is, is uh, uh, a follow-on to uh, the uh, uh, Tristan Smith et al. paper that takes into account the latest data from uh, ACT, among other things. <coughs> but the other papers uh, have quite different stories, and they may be plausible. Uh, each one uh, is trying to connect the early dark energy with some other relevant phenomenology, and uh, who knows? The, the main point I was trying to make is that uh, they're actually all giving very similar parameters. And uh, in the proposal that we've uh, just submitted, uh, that I just submitted along with Anatoly Klippen uh, for HST theory, uh, what we're working out is uh, the Smith et al. and the Murgia et al. model. But our point is that they're all pretty good. Uh, they're pretty similar. So even though they'll have different detailed uh, uh, particle physics stories behind them, uh, the cosmological predictions are really quite similar. Uh, higher A sub S, higher N sub S, and therefore more power, especially on galactic scales. And uh, so there is evidence that uh, we're seeing earlier formation of both massive clusters and protoclusters and massive galaxies than standard lambda CDM predicts. And, uh, and of course, we may see much more of this with James Webb. 
And uh, if that's the case, uh, that will be another strong argument for something like early dark energy, some early universe modification of uh, lambda CDM. Uh, and all of them uh, appear to have very similar effects. In fact, there's a, a, an argument that uh, uh, is that uh, as soon as you do any, so first of all, there's a very nice recent summary by uh, George of Stathew of why it's very hard to make late universe modifications. Uh, you're almost forced if you want to try to solve this subtle parameter tension to make an early universe modification. And then all the early universe modifications are gonna have a higher N sub S and probably a higher A sub S. And so it can be very similar to this story. And they're all, all gonna predict earlier structure formation. Incidentally, earlier structure formation also means halos will tend to have higher concentrations. And uh, so, and what's beautiful about this in my opinion is that these are relatively low redshift and therefore observable tests of these high redshift modifications, which are not directly detectable, but have these wonderful indirect effects that we can then look for. So thanks very much, Alvaro, for that question. Uh, and I'm trying to uh, answer it uh, in a very uh, data dependent sort of way. Uh, the point is that, that these theories make predictions that are very testable. Thank you, Jan, for your answer. Okay, and then we have another question from the audience asked by Andrew Engel who says, excuse my ignorance, my impression from Stacy's webinar was the striking predictions for local universe, but less evidence at cosmological scales. Is this impression completely wrong? Rhys mentioned in his webinar that the void hypothesis wasn't likely. Uh, I'm sorry, what is the void hypothesis? I, I don't know what that uh, means. Well, I, I think he's referring to Martin Rhys' talk, right? Because well, really look, I, I honestly don't know what, what was meant by the void hypothesis, but uh, look, large-scale structure looks very much like uh, what Lambda CDM predicts. Uh, to the extent that uh, there are problems, uh, aside from the Hubble tension, uh, I think uh, the, the general structure is very similar, except that we may be seeing earlier formation of uh, structures, galaxies, and, and clusters than standard lambda CEM predicts. And as I've emphasized, that's exactly what this early universe modification, uh, early dark energy would predict. So uh, on the whole, uh, lambda CDM is a remarkably good fit, both to early universe data and nearby universe data, including galaxy data. Uh, and uh, what we're looking at now are modifications in that same general framework. It's of course always possible that there'll be uh, evidence that turns up that makes us question the whole framework uh, and a so-called scientific revolution has to happen. Uh, that of course can happen. And uh, I've tried to indicate that uh, since we don't really understand why the theory has the structure it does, let alone why the parameters have the values they have, uh, we have to be open to new data. But the currently existing data seems to me not to be a, a very strong challenge to standard lambda CDM, except for the Hubble tension. That's the that's the most severe challenge. As much as a six sigma challenge, and you can't you can't dismiss challenges like that, especially when essentially all the nearby measurements are consistent with the uh, uh, value of the Hubble parameter of seventy or above, whereas the early universe measurements are really saying nope, it's sixty seven point four plus or minus point four. That's a big discrepancy. Thank you. Uh, then we have Anna who would like to ask a question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hi Anna. Hi, great to be here. Uh, it was a great talk. I have one simple question, although I'm not in the field, but I do follow a bit. Um, is there some prediction of the Lambda CDM that was proven to be right in advance? <laughs> not afterwards, not uh, th that you th don't need to fine tune some parameters and reshape the image of the universe and things like that. Uh, some simple thing that was right in uh, advanced and shown to be right by the observations. Thank you. Well, uh, historically, uh, I think the thing that first uh, made us think that there was something fundamentally right about uh, CDM, cold dark matter, uh, was 
the COBE observations, the Cosmic Microwave Background Explorer Satellite. Uh, there were also some ground-based observations, actually balloon observations, that uh, came in at roughly the same time. But because the uh, precision of the COBE observations was so much greater, uh, this is the uh, uh, microwave radiometer observations, uh, the team led by George Smoot. Uh, and what they showed was the first part of that angular power spectrum, the first big wiggle, and then they began to see the evidence Many happens for the second level. That basic structure had been calculated years before. Uh, and uh, aside from fine adjustment of parameters to fit precisely omega matter, omega matter turns out to be largely determined by the ratio of the first peak and the second peak. Uh, but, and we didn't know exactly what the numbers were, but uh, aside from a uh, slight adjustment, the basic pattern was exactly what we saw. And I remember, uh, that when we saw that first data come in, uh, I think it was 1992, uh, we were basically uh, walking on air. Uh, I mean, the, this was such a perfect uh, uh, agreement. And it's the, it was the first data that we had. That, And then another thing that happened uh, around that same time was the first large-scale redshift surveys uh, came in. Uh, so the very first large-scale redshift survey, we call it CFA-1, the Center for Astrophysics uh, Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. So that's 1983. And our 1984 paper, uh, Blumenthal, Faber, me, and Reese, uh, used that data uh, and compared it to the predictions of the theory. And we showed that especially the uh, lower omega matter version looked like a very good fit to that data. So already by 1984, when our paper came out, uh, we were beginning to feel that Lambda CDM that, that CDM and, and with a fairly low value of omega matter and therefore likely a large value of the cosmological constant. Uh, we already said that uh, this is a remarkably good fit to the data and therefore it deserved to be tested. And then when we got the first uh, cosmic microwave background data that began to show us uh, the structure of the fluctuations, uh, that was again a, a fantastic agreement. So right from the beginning, uh, it looked like uh, this theory uh, really had possibilities. And uh, of course, uh, the evidence has only gotten stronger. Thank you. Good question. And, and it's an historical question and a lot of people don't know the history. Thanks. Thomas, you wanted to ask another question, right? Yes. So I was here again, inspired by a question from the Q&A by um, Isaura Luisa Fuentes Carrera, um, who is asking in this new galaxy formation evolution scenario that you described where um, matter is falling on top of these prolate halos in a, in a very specific uh, anisotropic way. Um, is there room for galaxy interactions and mergers, say at various redshifts and how you would uh, sort of quantify this? Is there a prediction on that? And so my spin on this would be, does that actually induce any very particular nucleus to spheroid scaling relations? Like, would you expect more efficient nucleus formation in prolate halos than in oblate halos at, at different redshifts? So uh, thanks for the question. Uh, there are essentially no oblate halos. Uh, if you look at, uh, uh, so oblate basically means two large axes, one small axis, and dark matter halos don't look like that. Uh, they're either prolate or spheroidal. Uh, there are essentially no oblate halos. They're oblate galaxies, of course, disk galaxies. Uh, and we think that that's largely because of angular momentum. Uh, and the reason that the angular momentum is so important is that uh, when the gas comes in, it can lose energy, but retain angular momentum. You can't easily lose the angular momentum. And so as it comes in with large angular momentum uh, and uh, it loses energy, and so therefore the radius of the orbits decreases, uh, it has to form a disk. So uh, that, that's the part of the uh, Laplace story that does apply. Uh, so in the early stages of galaxy formation, when the dark matter is gravitationally dominant, uh, that doesn't apply. Uh, the the uh, ordinary matter hasn't come in uh, at low radius enough uh, to have its uh, uh, angular momentum effect uh, turn the galaxies into oblate objects. But in the early universe, when dark matter is dominant, uh, the halos being uh, mostly prolate 
govern uh, the structure of the galaxies. And what I tried to indicate uh, about the mergers, and I didn't have time, uh, uh, I was seeing I was starting to run low on time, so I didn't have time to run that uh, video, it's full two minutes, uh, is uh, that when galaxies merge, they'll tend to merge, they'll tend to be oriented along the same filaments. So they're gonna tend to come in uh, in the same long axis. And what happens is that the stars also uh, have a random uh, velocity, which is larger, uh, velocity dispersion, which is larger along the long axis and smaller along the two perpendicular. So that's what's gravitationally, uh, that's what's fighting against gravity and supporting these structures. That's that's what supports the, uh, it was Beppe Tormann, uh, the, the Italian uh, uh, theorist and, and simulator who first pointed out that that's what makes these uh, halos be prolate. Uh, and that's the same thing that's keeping the stars prolate. But uh, when a lot of gas comes in, it'll flow into the center. You get a big central starburst and that's, uh, going to have a very similar effect gravitationally to uh, what happens around an AGN. Uh, once you've got a, a more or less spherical uh, central potential, that's going to sphericalize uh, all the orbits. It's going to penalize these highly elliptical orbits, and it's going to favor the circular orbits. And so it, it tends to circularize the whole halo. Uh, so the inner part of the halo becomes much more circular. Uh, that's what happened. And that's what we explain in our uh, more detailed papers, for example, Tomasetti et al. Uh, and it would be lovely to actually see the uh, halos having the, the galaxies, the, the prolate galaxies that are near each other along the same filament lining up with each other. That's what our, our uh, simulations predict. And what we found, this is this paper that Viraj Panja led, was that we just don't have enough redshifts of these uh, lower mass galaxies. Uh, partly because when observers ta target galaxies to get redshifts, they tend to look at the face-on ones, the ones with more or less uh, uh, you know, high uh, axis ratios. And so they've just biased against getting uh, the, it's not that these galaxies are too low mass, they're not. Uh, it, it would be a relatively short-term program uh, to get the extra thousand or so redshifts that we think we need to actually uh, uh, see this effect or else rule it out. Pablo, next. Oh, the last one is from Taymour Saif Olahi. Uh, he's asking, as long as we are talking about planets, galaxy, and cosmos all together in one webinar, he, I was wondering if the universe could be habitable in the higher redshifts. Sure, why not? Uh, so what happens is that uh, at high redshifts, uh, heavy elements are going to be mainly formed by core collapse supernovae. Uh, it takes a while uh, to get neutron star mergers. Uh, and so you're not going to get uh, very much of the uranium and thorium uh, because uh, all of the neutron stars will form quickly uh, from O stars. Uh, the merging may take quite a long time. Uh, and of course, we're still seeing neutron star mergers today. Uh, the merger rate is probably being measured by the rate of uh, short duration gamma ray bursts. Those are probably neutron star mergers. Uh, so we have evidence that uh, it starts in the early universe, but it continues throughout uh, history. So uh, the early uh, uh, forming uh, stars and their planets will be relatively deficient in iron and the iron group elements, uh, nickel, uh, et cetera, uh, because those come from type 1As and those are uh, white dwarf explosions, uh, probably mainly white dwarf mergers, we now think. Uh, so again, those are gonna take a while. So the very earliest uh, stellar systems and their planets, uh, they will have metals, mainly alpha elements, uh, carbon, oxygen, uh, silicon, magnesium, and so on. Uh, and so they'll form planets with nice, uh, mantles, but probably somewhat deficient in their cores, in their iron cores, because uh, not yet very many uh, type 1As. So uh, an interesting question is uh, to work out how uh, the typical planets will evolve in their uh, composition as time goes on. Uh, and I don't think anybody's really done that. 
th there's been a little discussion of this in the literature, but uh, uh, as especially because of this very recent discovery of the formation of R process elements and the fact that the R process elements uh, include the two long lived radioisotopes, thorium and uranium. Uh, that's obviously a, a, a nice uh, area for research. And that's in our uh, proposal that we're writing uh, for uh, further NASA's funding for exactly this. Uh, but lots of other people can get into the game. And, and a number of other people have already started writing papers in the last few years that are uh, somewhat relevant. Although no one seems to have looked at this issue of uh, geodynamos uh, or planetary dynamos generating magnetic fields and the effect of uranium and thorium. Our paper's uh, the first on that. Uh, so, but the, the whole subject of uh, the evolution of the planets uh, and the types of planets we're likely to find that form at different epochs, uh, that, that's a very interesting question that uh, I think is very much deserving of research. I, I've just sketched a few of the ideas that uh, I've thought about, uh, you know, having now started to think about planets in the context of galaxy evolution. Thanks, Joe. Sure, thank you for the question. And the very last question from Maren, please go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, this is probably a question that has more to do with my ignorance about um, habitable zones and life forming on planets. Uh, you mentioned that because there are so few planets known that are even in the range of Earth mass, but mostly are factor two, five that a lot of studies now focus more on the possibility of the moons of these planets to be more, let's say, suitable. So a while ago, since we now spend a lot of time in uh, lockdown, I saw studies that the fact that the moon or our moon is moving away and the tidal force is becoming weaker and weaker was actually one of the reasons that made the formation of life on Earth possible because the conditions were more stable. But if the water is on the moon and the more massive host planet is, act, or is creating the tides, wouldn't it mean that the moons are exactly not the objects we should look like, we should look for? for so uh, thanks for the question. The, the, so here's a few uh, uh, random uh, uh, remarks in response to your question. So first of all, <clears throat> uh, the Earth's moon is the has the highest mass uh, yeah. ratio of any moon or uh, moon planet uh, system uh, that we know uh, by far. The Earth's moon is unusually massive, uh, and but even then, it wasn't really massive enough to retain an atmosphere, let alone water. Uh, whatever water it has is probably frozen ice uh, at the north and south poles of the moon that don't get any significant uh, uh, solar heating. Uh, and, and there isn't much. So uh, it seems quite unlikely that life could uh, evolve, at least life like ours, that depends on uh, carbon and, and water, uh, on uh, the moons of the inner planets and the outer planets. Uh, then, then there's the problem uh, that uh, even if they're close enough to their star to be reasonably warm, uh, they're going to have uh, uh, this problem that they're going to have a, a, a great change in the solar radiation when they're behind their 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 big planet. <clears throat> uh, so another, but of course it's also possible, as I was saying, uh, connected uh, with Europa and Enceladus, for example, that have liquid water under their ice. Uh, that uh, and and the heating uh, is uh, largely due to torque, to gravitational uh, uh, tidal uh, friction, tidal forces. Uh, it's entire, but also uh, radioactive. So it's, it's uh, certainly possible that life could evolve. Uh, there is an interesting question whether life can start in an aqueous environment or whether it needs to start on land. Uh, and uh, that then requires that you can't have a completely water world. You have to have at least some continents. The argument that you need to start on land is largely due to my Santa Cruz colleague, uh, uh, who, who's worked on this, uh, and uh, it's, I think, an open question. Some people think uh, life may have started at uh, the thermal vents uh, where C4 is spreading, uh, but uh, that requires a very different uh, environment than Dave Deemer 
uh, D-I-E-M-E-R, uh, my Santa Cruz colleague, who argues, no, what you really want is exactly what Darwin speculated, a warm pool near volcanoes uh, on uh, uh, early uh, uh, planets. Let me, let me remark uh, briefly about uh, this question of the super Earths. There's no fundamental reason that the super Earths uh, with masses of uh, four or so times the mass of Earth, the, the common kind of planet that we see in half of all planetary systems at least, uh, why they can't support life. Uh, however, uh, if such a planet has the same composition, the same ratio of uranium and thorium to the mantle uh, elements, uh, silicon, magnesium, oxygen, etc., cetera, uh, we're gonna have much more volcanism and they may not be able to sustain a magnetic field. And the reason is that the heat loss is from their surface, whereas the heat uh, generation is from their volume at the same abundance. And uh, of course, the surface to volume, uh, surface goes as radius squared, volume goes as radius cubed. And so the ratio goes as R. So it's the radius that comes in and the super earths at the same composition as Earth is going to have, they're going to have larger radii, 50% or 100% larger radius. And the result is that they're going to have much more effect of uh, the radiogenic heating. We did, we, mar we marked this in like one sentence in our paper, uh, but uh, the, the scaling is sort of obvious. Uh, so, what one should do is uh, do detailed modeling of these planets, taking into account also the fact that in general planets are going to have different ratios of the iron group elements, the mantle elements, and the radiogenic elements. And, and that's what we're proposing uh, in, in the proposal that we're just writing now to NASA. Okay, so the, uh, these are excellent questions. And I think to a first approximation, we don't know the answers. And, and we should be able to, uh, to answer these questions by doing a little bit more theoretical work. Thanks. Good questions. Well, I guess it's time to wrap up, even though I guess we could talk for hours. <laughs> but then, <laughs> thank you all for joining us today for Joy's talk. And thank you very much, Joel, for t taking the time to tell us about your work. Oh, this has thank been so much fun. Thanks for uh, uh, all the audience and the great questions. And uh, also, thanks uh, especially to my friends and former students uh, who joined the panel. Well, by the way, uh, some people couldn't, but they sent their best, like Guillermo Barro, for example. He was really sorry. And most of the people you mentioned in this- Martin Reese also apologized. He said he had a conflict because uh, I had been on the panel for his discussion. Yeah. So um, for uh, the audience, please be so kind and fill out the survey at the end of this Zoom webinar. Our next scheduled talk will be on April 23rd by Juan Maldacena, who is Carl Feinberg Professor in the School of Natural Sciences at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. Juan will talk about black holes, Hawking radiation, and the nature of space-time. Stay safe, stay healthy, and until the next quarter webinar in astrophysics. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Bye. Ciao.